first to come face to face with Theo Pafitis and his fellow dragons is Buckingham-based entrepreneur Deborah Lockhart. Please be kind. Who's taken a giant leap of faith to get her new venture off the ground. I left a highly paid job in the corporate world to start my business. But I'm very passionate about what I do and I'm determined to make this a success. And Deborah's hoping her wide and varied product range... Your gin, your water, sanitizer. ...will impress the five fearsome interrogators she's about to meet. I believe the dragons are going to want to invest in me and my business because the products themselves can span out in a multitude of different areas, which shows great potential for both the dragons and for me. Hello, dragons. My name is Deborah, and I'm here today seeking an investment of £50,000 in exchange for 10% share in my business, Honest Blends a company that's striving to bring luxurious, plant-based products to the market that are organic, they're fair trade, and they're packaged with the environment in mind. As you can see from the very busy table, the product range is rather extensive. I started the business making my own blend of loose leaf tea. And the reason behind that is because a lot of tea bags that are marketed at the moment have plastic in them. I then introduced my Honest Gin Blends. Honest Blends has only been trading for just over a year, but in that very short period of time, I've seen just shy of £90,000 turnover of sales. But like many businesses, the arrival of COVID presented me with many challenges. So, with our distillery, we've been manufacturing hand sanitizer. That is the very short and brief introduction to myself, but I think we should get down to doing some tasting. <laughs> confidently presented pitch from an entrepreneur who's passionate about the planet, Deborah Lockhart. Wow, <gasps> look at that. Ooh, it's a real goodie one. box. That's too much choice here. <laughs> She's offering 10% of her upmarket eco products company. Talking about posh, Mr. Pathetis. Oh, the, the little <laughs> thingy. It came out on its own. In return for a £50,000 cash injection. It is pure gin. It's 40%. Not too early in the day. The dragons have poured, squirted, sniffed and sipped. That's very smooth. Look like a dragon now. <laughs> <laughs> Breathing fire. And now Sarah Davies wants to understand how Deborah is producing this multitudinous mix of merchandise. So, Deborah. Yes. That's going to make me jump every time somebody goes Deborah. <laughs> There's a lot to take in there. There so is. I'm just wanting to get a bit of a picture of yes. kind of what it looks like at your house. So Chaos. Yes. I can imagine. <laughs> so you're buying in tea in bulk and... So it is coming over in bulk and then I'm having it all blended per my recipes up in Scotland and then we package it individually. The coffee already comes packaged for us and the gin is my recipe and that is made for us at the at the distillery so clearly the environmental stuff is absolutely at the heart of of your yes, business it is and i'm pleased to say this is properly compostable yes so it's made out of sugar cane but the lid and the label is also compostable gosh this totally at the end of the day can go into composting yes 100 percent that's quite something A strong start to the pitch as Deborah's planet-friendly water bottle makes a splash with the dragons. Retail giant Theo Pafitis is curious to know more about the brains behind this ethical offering. You're asking me to invest in you. I'm very investable. <laughs> <laughs> By the way, I am. <laughs> Strangely enough, I thought you might say that. <laughs> So, I'd like to know, I want to know about Deborah, the career woman. So, my background has very much been in the automotive industry. Very quickly fell into the IT world and became a global sales director and travelled the world. Um, and I fell back into automotive and started working for Tesla and BMW. 
What was your role? Can you tell us what the role was? So I was starting new lines of businesses for them. So could we categorise it in two words? Business development. Yes, that's a great way. I've got the foundations to build from nothing. So in terms of the products that you've got, I think the bottle of water is fantastic. How much does it cost and how much are you selling it for? So it cost me 79 pence. If we upscale, we can get that down to about 50 pence. OK. The packs of 24 are being sold for just under 40 pounds. 40 pounds? That price can come down if we get to a stage where we are mass producing. And, and that is your threat, is that somebody will mass produce it. Don't think that the big conglomerates are not having their boardroom meetings and saying, how do we become eco-friendly in the year X? And you'll be left behind. Tuka Suleiman has concerns over how competition from the water big boys could dilute the USP of the business. Now, the other Deborah in the den wants to find out if the entrepreneur has a standout item within her colourful cocktail of goods. If I said to you, focus on one product... Yes. ..what would it be? Gosh, the million-dollar question. So I think it's going to be the sanitizer. Um, we have a very loyal customer base and there's a real direct need for it. So See, this is interesting, because when I've asked you to focus on something, it's something that we spent no time at all looking at at the beginning. I know. So you've done an awful lot of work on what you have over here in terms of the gin, and they're all very specific, competitive markets. Is your thinking that you're just going to completely sideline all of that now and then just focus on the hand sanitizer? Um, I'd love to take the advice on that. That's one of the reasons why I'm here. Um, my head is somewhat busy with all of the different products and where can I go with each of them. OK, so I'm just going to level with you where I'm at. When you came in, I was really struggling to work out if it was a tea company, a coffee company, where the gin came in. Then, all of a sudden, the whole proposition was turned on its head. Yeah. And you realise this is a water business or a hand sanitizer business. And I feel like you've kind of let yourself down here. Because you've made me feel that you are all over the place. Mm -hmm. It doesn't give me the confidence that if I put money into this, you are going to make success of it. So... I won't be investing and I'm out. Sarah Davies' doubts over Deborah's entrepreneurial acumen means she's the first dragon to exit the discussion. And it seems Tate Lalvani has been stewing over why her range of eco products feels familiar. My question is on your brand name. Yeah. Now, you probably know that a huge brand, Honest Company by Jessica Alba in the US. Yes. And she's got the same ethos. So, isn't that a bit of a conflict? Um, I do know that Jessica is focusing on the household baby products. That's not an area that I'm going to focus in. That being said, I'm very open at looking to change the branding without losing the Honest Blends message. Is there another brand out there called Honest Tea? There is. So, there's a massive brand out there called Honest. There's now another brand called Honest Tea. So that's owned by Coca-Cola. Yeah. But at the moment, they don't have any issue with us making our tea range. Well, that's fine when you're a tiny little brand, but what actually happens is they wait until you've got enough money and then they think, we'll have some of that. That then leads back into what Tej was saying about a slight rebrand. Yeah, but it starts knocking into what we're investing in. That's yes. the problem. But it also gives me an insight into your judgment because you're aware of those things and you still carried on with a brand that is actually already owned, you know, a tea business. So I did that before I knew. Um... But you should have known. You should have done your research before you produce anything. You go out and you see, can I get the domain name? Is there anybody else there doing it? That's like the A, B, C. Which we C. did. We got the domain name. We had yeah, all of the social media pages. but you didn't Google pages. and say, oh, dear, there's another T out there that says honesty. 
My heart is sitting here going, I'd love to work with you. Please do. <laughs> There's too many errors in this. I've never had to say I'm out to a Deborah. I think <laughs> this is the first time. But I, I'm sorry, I won't be investing in you, Deborah. I'm out. Green Queen Deborah Meaden pours cold water on any hope of a partnership as she calls into question not only the future of the brand, but also her namesake's judgment. Tej Lalvani already has an investment in a tea venture. Will he brew up a deal with the entrepreneur? Look, I think you literally have enough products for three episodes of Dragon's Den. <laughs> 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 but as an investor, it's a bit of a nightmare because you haven't really got anything that I can say, that's working, let's push that. I really want it to be part of your journey, but there's just too much involved. And I don't think 50,000 pounds is going to do it. So I'm going to say I'm out. Look, your eco credentials are immaculate. Thank you. But you've come in the den with a very complicated scenario. My concern is you're a lady of all trades and a master of none. So for that reason, I'm out. Tuka Suleiman decides he doesn't have a taste for the packed product line, and with four dragons down, Deborah's only hope for investment lies with Theo Pafitis. Has she demonstrated enough entrepreneurial spirit to be in with a shot? You're a great talker, you're very passionate, and I love you. <laughs> Thank you. But you forgot the most important thing. Brand, brand, brand. And the brand that you've come with, sooner or later, someone's going to shut you down. Which means you haven't got business. What have you got? You've got you. And you're excellent. And whilst it's impossible for me to invest, I would offer you a job tomorrow. So I'm going to say I am out. Mm -hmm. But if you decide you want to work with somebody, pick up the <laughs> phone and call me. There's a job waiting for you. Oh, Good wow. luck. Thank you. I really right. appreciate I wish you the, all the best. opportunity. Focus, focus, focus. I will do. Okay, Thank you. Bye. Deborah may be leaving without the investment she was seeking, but she walks away with a job offer from newly returned dragon Theo Pafitis. I am feeling disappointed that I didn't get the investment, but I'm ecstatic and elated with the feedback that I got from the dragons. I didn't let myself down. It was what I needed to hear, and I'm really, really grateful for what I got from them. Next to enter the den a South African expat, James Inglesby, and his business partner and fiance, Venezuelan-born Diana Ziegler, with a range of items they believe are both luxuriously appealing and planet-friendly. Our product is very great because we created something that is not only sustainable, but it actually works. Drink or apply? Apply. Apply. Apply, apply. it's got yeah. a pump on it. Yeah. yeah, yeah. It's not really good, though, if we have to sit here working out if it's a drink or something you apply. While the dragons wrestle with what the product range actually is, James is more concerned about being stumped himself. My biggest fear is that they find some strange number that I don't know and just or throw me off. Or I forget, <laughs> yeah. We are feeling very nervous. <laughs> Good afternoon, Dragons. I'm James. And hi, I'm Diana. We are the founders of Nereus London. Today, we're here to ask the Dragons for £50,000 for a 10% share of our business. We create a truly luxurious spa experience using premium shampoos, body washes, and conditioners. Best of all, they're genuinely sustainable and plastic-free. Like many millennials, we are taking more conscious purchase in or in... <laughs> what, and what Diane and I dis discovered <laughs> during this journey of trying to find more conscious purchase ideas was that the average UK household uses about 216 plastic bottles a year. 
So yeah, okay. You're here. <laughs> um, there must be a better way to do this. Oh. Yes. So we set out to develop and formulate our own products. They had to be clean beauty. And of course, yeah, of course. they had to work on Diana's hair. And <laughs> Oh gosh. Come on, Diana, get with the program. <laughs> well, to be fair, you're in a second language, aren't you, Diana, as well? Yeah. So. <laughs> After all of this, we have amazing reviews from loyal customers. To date, we sold over 3,000 units, at a turnover of about £35,000. So we would love for one of you dragons, or all of you dragons, <laughs> to be part of this uh, journey to sustainability and premium hair and body care. On the gift boxes, you will find the hand gel and the hair and conditioner shampoo. There may have been some nerves on show, but James Inglesby and Diana Ziegler finished their pitch. Well done, you got through it. It, <laughs> it, it came back. A, a little bit, but it came back. No, that's good. They're seeking a £50,000 investment for a 10% stake in their business. Peter Jones is the first to question the toiletries to some. You've come up with a range of hair premium body beauty products. Yeah. What's your background? I used to work for Unilever and I've been formulating and creating deodorants, toothpaste, all sorts of bits and pieces. My real strength is product development. I do that now as a consulting job. I also do that for some other brands. Well, fantastic. Yeah. OK, and tell me about the story behind, because I picked out of the box yeah. your products, and yeah. some of them look good. This looks like a little bit of a shambles. Yeah. What's behind that? So we wanted to take all the plastic away from our products. Um, this label is made of wool pulp, so it's going to start disintegrating, and you can put it on the compost, and it will just eat away. They end yeah. up like this? They end up like that, yes. You start off like that, and then over time, they start breaking down. So if you open our boxes, they'll see like a warning card telling people that this is something that is naturally going to happen. And how long does it take to get to that stage? Because it turns up looking lovely. Yeah, yeah. It takes, what, three, four weeks, maybe longer? I personally wouldn't mind it, but I know there are other dragons who would mind it. But to be honest, some of my other labels go a bit dodgy. Yeah, yeah. Honestly, I just want it to look lovely when I get it. But it's not particularly aesthetically pleasing it ends up like that. I'm not sure people will appreciate the fact that yeah. they're buying a product that ends up like this. Our customers seem to like it. We've had over 360 orders on Amazon and we've only had three returns. The entrepreneurs may be embracing sustainability, but their eco-friendly labels are proving divisive. Will the positive vibes from the den's most ardent environmentalist mean she's also inclined to green light their branding? I think they look beautiful. Your packaging looks great, because I'm fed up with receiving um, organic, sustainable products in plain brown packaging. Everybody's gone for the look at us, we don't even use ink. Yeah. Um, so I like that bit at the bad side of it. If this sat on a shelf somewhere, I don't even know if you're, you're a whiskey. Our customers actually like the boxes so much, because those are made from recycled corrugate. They're, they're corrugate, no, right? No, they're beautiful. I can imagine a customer getting that and thinking, that is lovely, but th that is a very different experience to having that on a retail shelf. There is nothing on the outside of your packaging that tells me what it is. Deborah Meaden deems the entrepreneur's marketing minimalism a wasted opportunity to broadcast their brand. Now, Stephen Bartlett wants to put the spotlight on the pair's projections. In terms of your growth going forward then, year over year, so what are you forecasting? Yeah, so we're doubling very quickly. We plan to do £250,000 uh, year one, and then year two, five hundred, um, year three. We're, we're going to get up to year five where we want to be doing six million. So year one, what's the growth? I'd say 55%. The number? Oh, the so, actual yeah. number for year one. Whew, that's a good number to ask me. Off the top of my head, uh, so it would be uh, minus 20% of... Um, uh, so it's going to be £125,000 profit. And then net is going to be minus... Two, two, uh, minus... Uh, 50. 50, yeah. 
I feel like you're not very confident with these numbers. No, no, I, I know the percentages. The overall numbers are a, a bit more of a, a difficult one. You can admit, you can say, I don't know my numbers, because if I interrogate the strategy that's going to make those numbers come true, I, I feel like you'll get yourself tied up in a, a little web of nonsense. Yeah, sorry about that. So it starts 250 for our year one, 500, 750, uh, a million, and then it'll go to year five, six would be six million, um, five million, mm. sorry. And how'd you get from one million to five million between years four and five? And I thought it was six million was going to be the turnover. I also thought you were going to double year on year, but double 500's not 750, and double 750's not a million, and double a million's not five million. And I think you know where I'm going. I have got zero confidence in any word that's coming out of your mouth, because we've had a load of codswallop for the last few minutes. Sarah Davies loses patience as James fails to nail his numbers. And it appears Peter Jones's tolerance has also been tested. I'm sitting here thinking about being polite, but I have to say, this is a shambles, frankly. At the moment, this pitch has no substance for me. I don't even know what Nureus is. I don't know really what the brand's saying. I really need to know quickly what this business is all about. Something that is quite different is that these are all custom made, so nothing that you see here has not been made by us. Each one of these fragrances has been smelt tested by Dinah. That's still not good enough. If I'm launching a hair product and I've got a team of people that are putting a product to the market, I would bloody well expect them to smell it before they launch it. So let's go deeper. Let's find out what this is all about. We wanted to create a brand that was all about sustainability, but it will actually perform because I have such a sensitive um, allergies to a lot of chemicals. And having those, I want to remove my lifestyle to have a more like a vegan shampoo, you know, like we tested all their like natural shampoos, but they actually didn't work. Great, so I've got the journey, but how okay. am I seeing on your product what it does? How are you going to tell me, as a potential consumer, the reason why I need to buy your product? So, I, I mean, the main reason why you want to buy our product is, first of all, the fragrances and the experience that we're going to create for you. So, like, as you can see here, how we've set up all the ingredients, this whole spa experience. No, James, you haven't. You've given me a box with a product in it. Yeah. That's, there's no experience here yet. Yeah. And the brand isn't telling me what the experience could be. You have got to find a way of shortening that answer to Peter's question. Why? Why buy me? Yeah. You know, and it took you ages to do that. <laughs> and you've got to work that out. I'm afraid you haven't quite inspired me enough to think that I want to, to get involved. I'm sorry, I'm out. It's a huge blow, as a failure to succinctly sell the USP of their business makes the Den Sustainable Dragon, Deborah Meaden, take an early bath. And now it appears Stephen Bartlett has been visualising a rather unexpected scenario. Um, question. I'm at home, I'm in my boxer shorts. Yeah. Tuesday, it's raining outside. Bit bored. Pick up my phone. Open up social media website. Scrolling down the news feed. Boom, I see you. What does it say? Create a luxury spa experience at home. OK, if you're telling me that you're framing your business as a spa experience, then I look to the product and I think, well, that's not what you're delivering for your customer. And so for that reason, I'm going to unfortunately have to say that I'm out. James, Diana, this has to say what it does on the tin if you're going to have a chance of launching a new brand. So I would say at the moment this business is totally uninvestable. So I'm out. James, you're clearly from the industry and have put the blood, sweat and tears in to get a business off the ground. My concern is you haven't demonstrated to me today that you have a solid grasp on the business and have the business acumen, therefore, to take the business to the next level. So I won't be investing in that amount. Four dragons have now washed their hands of an investment. James and Diana's last chance of a deal rests with high street heavyweight Tuka Suleiman. Could the eco-friendly brand be perfect for his portfolio? OK, retailers 
want sustainable brands. Yeah. They want them. And I am looking for sustainable brands because I've got a home for them. Yes, it ticks the boxes. Yeah. Um, look, guys, I, I am very tempted to make you an offer. I am tempted. You know, I could get this into three or four retailers tomorrow if it had the correct message. But I know you've gone so far with the branding. You guys have got your own agenda set up. I wouldn't want to change too much, take too much of the company, and that would be fair of you. So I'm not going to invest today, and I'm out. No, thank you so much. James, Diana, thank you. Thank no, you thank guys. you, guys. I really appreciate all the feedback. Thank you so much. What a pleasure. Thank you. Bye, guys. Bye, bye. Two Kasuliman keeps his pounds in his pockets, and the eco-entrepreneurs leave empty-handed. Their green credentials may have been commendable, but their toiletry concept just didn't wash with the dragons. A lot of work to do. Eh? A lot of work to do. Hearing the truth is the best thing, and we can take on all that feedback and turn it into something better, really. I hope. We hope. <laughs> <laughs>my name's David Wilkes and I'm looking for £50,000 for 5% in my company which manufactures a big water saving product which is in a little box called the Interflush available from my website interflush.co.uk and I shall just demonstrate what it does now right just one little problem with that and all other flushing devices press the handle let go and they all flush fixed volumes of water. The full system load, away it goes. Now, as you can see, that's a lot of water every time. So if I just refill that with water, that's it. And whilst that's filling, you'll note the colours of this, red, white and blue. It's invented in Yorkshire and it's made in Yorkshire. Right, so there's the toilet pan. So that's flushing, pan clear, let go, stop flushing. Just use what water you need, and when you fit this, you save 47% of the flushing water. And that's it, basically. Available in a box. David Wilkes' DIY innovation is a simple attachment to the toilet, which enables the user to control the amount of water flushed by letting go of the lever. It has the potential to save millions of gallons, but only if he can persuade the public to buy into his concept. David, I'm Doug. Hi. Let's say somebody fits one of your thing jiggers into their toilet. Mm, an interflush, yes. An interflush. That's a change of behavior, isn't it? Yes. Yeah, I'm glad you're proud of it. Um, because my habit, I can't speak for everyone else's toilet flushing habits, is when I push down the lever, um, I push it down until I hear the toilet flushing, and I let it go, because I guess I assume it's all going to kind of take care of itself. Yes. But now I'm going to have to pay attention, yes. aren't I? I'm yes. going to have to push it down and watch. Is yes. that correct? Yes, just glance. Well, <laughs> for a period of time, I will be looking at my crap going down the Yes, toilet. yes. Just checking. Da David, the thought of having to look at my shit when I go to the toilet afterwards is sort of borderline for me, especially if you're going, as I would call it when I was a little kid and I haven't changed now, I call it big toilet. So when you go to the big toilet, you can't wait to close that top seat down. So I can't get my head round watching as if it's some form of ritual being quite a proud moment mm. with perhaps a little well, bloodle sort of, you know, yodel in the background sort of saying it's finished now and it's all over and it's gone away. Right. Well, you've just built it up to such a massive thing. Most people look inside, look at the pan anyway to make sure it's clear for the next person. So talking this up, that you're going to remember what's in the top. You don't remember it at all. All you remember is if it's out of the ordinary. Does that make sense to anybody else? David, David peripheral vision. It doesn't. It, it, doesn't, it gives me a bit of a vision of where you're going, but it, it, it sort of concerns me. Well, you're uh, not looking at it with the X-ray eyes of Superman, are you? David, you're very aggressive. 
David's hostile manners not endearing him to the dragons. He'll need to work much harder to persuade them he's worth investing in. I now understand the device. Just one small thing I don't understand. Anything about the business. Uh, all the money invested in this so far is just from me. It's got patent coverage on it, so there's a worldwide licensing right. Um, it depends which way humanity wants to go, basically. I mean, at the I'm moment... sorry, say that again? It depends which way humanity wants to go. Oh, humanity. Well, humanity. Mm -hmm. At the moment, we're using resources up at the rate of we need three and a half planets to supply them. Well, we haven't got three and a half planets, we've got one. Water saving is what it's all about. That may be the case. Oh, okay. somebody, somebody else needs to run with this. David's desire to make the world a better place is not impressing the dragons. Duncan Bannatyne wants to know where he's been trying to sell his product. David, who do you see your main customer base as? Um, anybody who wants to save water and money, basically. I was hoping you were going to say that you already sold it to a chain of hotels or a chain of pubs or bars or something like that, but you haven't. Now, a lot of my time has been wasted actually talking to water companies. Their revenue is from selling water, so something that'll save them so much water. Well, basically, if 25% of the population fitted this, the water companies would take a drop in revenue of £300 million a year. Most companies are in business primarily to make money. That's right. And if the water company reduces the water flow, it reduces its profit. That's right. right you yeah. thought it would... OK, it took a while for the penny to drop, but it dropped. <sighs> I'm saying I wasted a lot of my marketing time on approaching those people. David's lack of business now has exasperated Duncan Bannatyne. If I invested in you, David, you would just drive me mad. You know, um, I'm out. OK. Problem. One dragon is already out. Peter Jones, though, wants more financial detail to understand the investment opportunity. David, can we talk about some specifics? Yes. What's your revenue that you're expecting to make this year? 200k. 200k. Revenue? Turnover. Turnover. And what profit are you expecting to make this year? Probably none at first year, in common with most businesses. Really? No, no business that I've ever started or been involved with? What price will you be selling them at? 17.95. What's the wholesale price? Wholesale price, that'll be £9. And how many of these products will you sell through wholesale and how many products will you sell direct? Wholesale, maybe uh, 20,000. And th through direct? 20,000. So you're going to turn over about 540,000 this year now? Is it? I'm right. Fine. You haven't got a clue, have you? David, uh, I think you're completely uninvestable as an individual. Uh, the product just, it doesn't do anything for me at all and I'm absolutely not interested in investing in the product or you. OK, no Sorry, problem. Man. That's all right. David, I'm Theo. Hello, we haven't spoken. No, yeah. I'm not going to invest. OK. David's pitch is going disastrously. Only two dragons remain. Rachel Elnor suspects he's got his priorities all wrong. David, can I just ask, are you more of an eco-warrior than an entrepreneur? Yeah, I suppose I am, yeah. This could save 250,000 tonnes of carbon dioxide, over 500 million kilowatt hours of electricity. Are these more important to you than making money? The making money is a byproduct, that's true for me. The reason, you know, we're using all the planet's resources up now is because everybody's obsessed with making money. David, I'm going to declare myself out. I don't think it's one for me at all. David, you may very well view yourself as saving the world. No, oh, just water. In trying to save the world. But let me leave you with a message. I don't think you have a right to sit there and preach to me about how the world's going to hell in a handbasket solely because people want to make money, which is what you just said. I'll give you a response to that. There's a lot of good in making money. You want to know why? It drives people to do things, to innovate, to create, to be entrepreneurs, and to change the world. And so you say the business has to make money. No, it should be your driver to the, drive that profit, to drive this product. And because of that, you are not going to succeed. And so my message back to you is I would get off your holy horse. Well, I never was on one, and I'm sorry you got the wrong impression. I'm sorry you gave it. 
Oh, thank you. Goodbye. Thank you. David Wilkes has felt the full force of the dragon's disdain. His opinions were completely at odds with theirs, and they could see no way of working with him. If it doesn't sell, he doesn't get to save the world. So if he could think about getting it to sell, then he might save the world. He's flushed 10 years of his life down the toilet. Well, David, culture clash. But, but what do you mean, America? Well, th there were a whole lot of culture clashes. Yes, there the were. Way. They just didn't get it. The penny, um, the penny didn't drop. You came across, though, as quite defensive. One said you were aggressive. I think it, would, it looked more defensive, but it wasn't a kind of good way to persuade them of your point of view. They were asking the wrong questions all the time, and uh, they hadn't understood it, really. They hadn't understood that... Uh, we do need to save water. I've never met anyone who has so much strong feeling about toilet flushing, but it's really been a great pleasure. It's a waste to of water. <laughs> the next entrepreneur to enter the den has what he thinks will be a planet saving solution to the problem of plastic waste. I know in my mind that my product is something that not just the dragons need, but everybody needs. Bottles made of corn starch. Mm. This is going to be a quickie. That is the future, though. But, yeah, it is. Mike is feeling quite apprehensive about facing off with the dragons. I've never done anything like this before, so it's unknown territory. My biggest fear is forgetting the pitch, fear of forgetting the numbers. I'm hoping they'll not give me too much of a hard time. Hello, dragons. My name is Mike Shaw, and I'm here today to request from you £50,000 for a 10% stake in Eco for Life. Plastic pollution is a global issue. Single-use plastic is a major contributing factor of this. We have Eco for Life. The bottle made 100% from plant. Eco for Life Eco for Life bottles are fully compostable and they're great to refill. We launched in 2016 and we currently supply into a host of outlets, namely uh, health, festivals and schools. I'd like to offer you a bottle each and then I'd gladly take your questions. Yep. After a minor wobble, Mike Shaw recovers his composure and completes his pitch. Thank you. Thanks. He's asking for £50,000 in return for a 10% stake in his company. Thank you. Thank you. The product he's pushing is refillable water bottles made from the starch in corn plants. Tej Lalvani is first to quiz the eco-entrepreneur. Mike, um, I love it. I think it's great, you know, um, using corn to manufacture instead of plastics. Yeah. So how many manufacturers are currently making this bottle? One in Asia. There's only one in the world? Yes, as far as we know. The actual plant-based technology is used in a lot of products now, cups, bowls, plates, but we've located the only factory that can successfully make that bottle. Mike, how have you come to be in a relationship with this factory? My father-in-law was at a, an eco-resort in the Far East. He saw something very similar to this, and the waiter said, this bottle is made from plant. And he went, that's amazing. So he brought it back and he said, we need to do this. So I went, yeah, absolutely. Is he a big shareholder? We're both equal shareholders. But given the spotlight being on this at the moment, yes. you've got to assume that a lot of other factories are looking into being able to do this. Yes, so what we need to do is be a leading brand. So if people talk refillable plant bottles, they talk eco for life. Sarah Davies discovers the competition might be quick to clock the opportunity. Tuka Suleiman now has a few questions to ask about the Eco Products packaging. Look, you've done a good job. I love the brand. <laughs> Thank um, you. However, the branding itself is very poor. 
because it doesn't tell you use me again. If I went and bought this from a gym, I'd drink it and throw the bottle away because of the way it's portrayed to me. Now, if there was some form of message in the front that okay. said to me, you can use me over and over again. Yes. Your communication to the consumer is weak. So, Amatuka, I think that the packaging and design doesn't look that great. It doesn't grab my attention. Um, you know, the logo, it's a bit difficult to see. That definitely is something that needs to change. Yeah, I mean, I think that's where we don't have the understanding because we've never developed a brand. So, my focus is if I get investment from, from, you, from you guys, you know, to, to, for us to work together and drive this forward. Tej Lalvani shares Tuka Suleiman's concerns that the entrepreneur is missing a trick with the appearance of his product. Peter Jones now wants to delve into the financial sustainability of the business. You've been going since 2016. Yes, that's right. Give me some of your numbers. How, how successful has it been? OK, so uh, our first full year of trading, um, we turned over 51,000 and a net of 3,008. 2018, we did 304,000 with a net of 38,800. And this year to date, uh, we're on track to hit 585 with a net of 111. You've done well. Thank you. Previous to that, the company was launched through my other company. Tell me about that business. What does that do? We supply the travel industry with grocery. How big is that? What did that turn over last year? Uh, nine and a half million. Wow. But my focus is here currently. I haven't, my other team are dealing with the other business. So you're going to leave a business that's currently turning over nine and a half million pounds? Yeah. To sell corn bottles? Sell corn, yeah, branded product, yeah. The revelation that the entrepreneur has already built up a multi-million pound company has pricked up the ears of all five dragons. Now, the den's green queen, Deborah Meaden, wants to get to the bottom of just how eco-friendly Mike's bottle really is. So this is industrial composting. I couldn't put it in my garden. You can put it in your compost. If it's, man if it's a good managed compost heap, it will biodegrade, yeah. It's recyclable, I presume, as well. It's not a recyclable product. Really? No. No. Our focus initially was for it to be fully compostable. So, what happens if this ends up in landfill? Um, if it ends up in landfill, it will sit there as a bottle. But it's not good to compostable goods in landfill, is it? <sighs> no. It's... no. No. Yeah. So, for me, this isn't the, like, clear and the champion answer of the, the, the world's problems, because this is not recyclable. I know what you say about refillable, but people use it and they'll chuck it away. But I'm looking for the long-term answer, so I'm afraid it's not one for me. I won't be investing. I'm out. A compostable but non-recyclable product is a can of worms for Deborah Meaden, and she ends her interest. And it appears Sarah Davies hasn't been fully convinced about the planet-saving potential of the corn container either. I'll tell you where I'm at with this. I get it, but but not totally. OK. To me, if I, if I was buying a multiple-use bottle, I want something that looks like my water container that I've got to remember that I'm going to fill it up multiple times, not something that I'll get home and leave on the side and my husband will put in the recycling, thinking it's an empty plastic bottle that we shouldn't refill. OK. And my concern is the fact that, really, we shouldn't really be putting this sort of stuff in the recycling, cos it's not really plastic recycling. It just doesn't quite all add up as being the right solution longer term. OK. So, good luck walking out of here with an investment, but it won't be from me. I'm out. Right. As it stands, in my view, it's not investable. It needs total reconstruction. OK. However, I love the brand. It's got legs. And I, I can see what could be done with it. So, I'll make you an offer. I'll give you all of the money, 
but I want to become a third partner. So the, the 50? For 50,000, for 33%. You've got a third, your father-in-law's got a third, and I'll have a third. That makes us equal partners. Tuka Suleiman spots some potential in the product and tables a bid. And his offer certainly appears to have caught Peter Jones's attention. So, Mike, obviously I've heard Tuka's offer. Um, and there's one thing for sure, you know, he's, he, he knows how to build brands, there's no doubt about it. Um, but I think it's going to be a tough one, and it's not something that I'm going to want to invest in. And so I'm going to say I'm out. OK. Thank you. I really like what you're doing, um, and I mean, my expertise is building brands and really trying to create products that resonate with consumers. And I think with, you know, a bit of work here, I could redesign that into something really quite special yeah. and attractive to appeal to consumers to buy. So I'd like to make you an offer. OK. And that is £50,000 for 30% of your business. OK. Tej Lalvani shows he's thirsty for a deal by undercutting his fellow dragon and asking for slightly less equity in the business. But it seems Tuka Suleiman has done some quick thinking to stay in the game and now has another proposition to put forward. I would share it with Tej. You have two dragons. So that means your father-in-law a third, you a third, Tej and I would be one six each. If, if, if he's interested. So, Tej, do you want to do what Tika's asking or do you want to go it alone? I like the 33%. But moving up from 30 to 33 percent. Oh, sure. Um, look, I mean, Tuka and I have many deals together. Um, we work well together. Um, so I'm happy to share it as well. Can I take a moment? Yeah, take, take your time. The entrepreneur has three offers to consider. Tuka Suleiman wants 33 and a third percent of the business and is prepared to split the deal with Tej Lalvani, who is also happy to share, whilst keeping a solo 30% offer on the table as well. But all three bids are seeking way more than the 10% that Mike is willing to hand over. OK. I like the idea of two. I think it's great. Will you both take 10%? I tell you what, Mike. Yeah. There's a lot of work here. And with a little change on, on the bottle and packaging, you'd have a premium product. And you will see the value we add. And the thing is, you haven't got anything completely unique. You don't own the rights to it. It's about building it and growing it as fast as you can. Yeah, yeah. and we together we drive this forward oh definitely great yes oh you're no, we'll, 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 make, we'll make this happen we'll well done we'll good, good. good happen. too okay excellent great thank you well done the dragons hold out and the entrepreneur loses his bottle and accepts their terms but he leaves the den with the fifty thousand pounds he was seeking and the expertise of two dragons on tap i'm so pleased to get to get Tej and Tuka on board. I think together, they're going to be brilliant for this. Well, I think it's great. Uh, there's nothing like it at the moment. They're strong in bringing brands to market. And I think, you know, with their help, sky's the limit, isn't it? Got to think of something corny to say now. Boom, boom. It's coming I think you might just have. <laughs> <laughs> Next to take his chance in the den is logistics director Nick Bennett who's hoping to find a way to impress one particular dragon. I'm looking for a brand ambassador. That's why I think Deborah would be an ideal choice. Do you know, I've had 
camping sites all my life, I have never slept in a tent. I've slept in plenty of caravans. Today's pitch may be no holiday for the entrepreneur who freely admits he's a bag of nerves. I've got a lot of people watching this, members of staff, my family, my friends. My biggest fear is making a fool of myself. Hello Dragons, my name's Nick Bennett and I'm here today to ask for £75,000 for a 20% stake in my business, Festival Bag. The UK festival industry produces over 23,000 tonnes of waste every year, two thirds of which will go into landfill and incineration. This isn't acceptable. And last year, my son went to a rather large festival in Berkshire and with his friends left his tent behind. So I vowed to do something about it. So I've come up with the idea of Festival Bag. Festival Bag comes fully kitted with all the equipment that you see before you. It is an online purchase from our website and comes with the basic, the best or the beginner service. The basic bag is delivered to your house and after the festival we ask you to pack up your equipment and take it home with you. Beginner bag is a fully inclusive service where it's delivered from our warehouse to the festival and then after the festival you pack your equipment up, you go to Festival HQ and you do a drop and go and then it's delivered home so the festival goer doesn't have to lug all their equipment back. And we've been hooked up with an international online retailer who offer rewards so if you don't leave it behind. That will then trigger the reward. So please join me to rock, reuse, reward and research. Thank you. With a plan to make festivals more environmentally friendly is Nick Bennett from Birmingham. He's looking for a £75,000 investment and in return he'll give away 20% of his company. Deborah Meaden's first millions were made in holiday parks and it appears she's still got her ear to the ground when it comes to developments in the industry. Thank you, Nick. So this is really current, isn't it? Absolutely, There's, Deborah. There have been headlines very, recently very saying that the operators of these big festivals are mortified at the amount of people actually just leave their tents behind. Yep. So this is a business that is hooking into a social conscience at the moment, isn't it, about yes. litter and which yes. is the best kind of business. We, we're creating an ideology. It's not about a tent, which is labelled as a festival tent, which carries another label, which is you can leave this or it goes to charity, because it absolutely doesn't. The star of the show is the bag. That's the product. And we will have a database, so we will know who's purchased the bag, what festivals they're going to, What's coming back, the return rate? So they're sending them back to you? Yes. The drop and go service would be a massive bottom. So they're renting a tent? No, no, they own it. They own it. OK, but they they're sending it. it back to you at the end yes. of it? Yes, because 79% of um, festival goers that leave equipment behind cite tardiness and tiredness on the Monday morning. Because some of these... Yeah, sorry, Nick. It sounds a really interesting concept, but I'm not quite getting it. So I don't even have to know anything else other than the fact that I turn up at the festival, drop me my bag, so I don't have to carry it there. At the end of the festival... No, I think you do. You take it yourself. Right? No, they drop it. The beginner is for a new festival goer, yeah. so we, we've tried to make it as white glove as possible. You just made it worse, not better. Thank you very right, much. Okay. <laughs> We're getting there. The bag is delivered to the festival. Yeah. So when the festival goer arrives, they go to our Festival HQ, and they're all the reference, and we just give them a bag. Got all that? Now, at the end of it, this is the bit you're trying to stop, people walking away and leaving their tents. What do I do? In all instances, you pack your equipment up, you go to Festival HQ and you do a drop and go, so you can potentially travel home light. And then two days after the festival, it's delivered home. Right, OK, so I own it, but you're getting rid of the carrying to and fro. Correct. Phew, got there. Relief all round as Deborah Meaden finally gets to the bottom of Nick's business model. Next, Theo Pafitis wants to pitch in with some insight into his first-hand camping experience. Can I just come in? Because I've got two daughters who well, think they were put on this earth to go to festivals. And I have had numerous conversations about sleeping bags that don't come back, tents that don't come back, and I'm saying, well, where are they? Ah, oh, they were covered in mud. They, somebody puked all over them, you know. Now, 
The key point for me is how much are you going to charge to deliver a whole set, take it away and send it back to me so I can make sure it's all right and clean it up? The basic bag is £75 to buy. 75 quid? So that's delivered to the home. You add to it, you put your wellies in. So I now carry it there and yep. clean it up, just like I could go to any shop and, and do the same thing. OK, what about delivering it to the festival, taking it away? The beginner, it's for a first-time festival goer because all the bags will be delivered en masse. Well, the answer the I'm looking for is, an, is a number. How much? £100. Um, these sort of tents, though, that sort of tent, they're, they're about 20 quid, aren't they? And I only know that because my daughter, she went to... It was Reading Festival. They did leave their tent there because she actually cut her leg and ended up with some of the medics. But my issue with this is that I actually think it's too expensive. Yours is 100 quid. My point is I can go down, buy a tent, 20 quid for the festival. My, so son, my son's going back to Reading and we're going to have to repurchase the equipment that he left behind. Yeah, my daughter is as well, but she split it with her boyfriend and it was a tenner each. Mm -hmm. So they are going to have to spend another 20 quid. But my point is that over the last two years then, they've only spent 40, whereas if they'd gone with your solution, they would have spent £60 more in one hit. Peter Jones and Theo Pafitis telling tales on their daughters has led to the conclusion that Nick's service is overpriced. Now, Sarah Davies has a confession to make. Nick, I've never been to a festival in my life, so this is all new ground to me, so I'm trying to wrap my head around it. Right, your business model relies on them packing everything back up and putting it in a bag. So the bit that it's solving is the getting the bag home. Correct. I've tried to take the hassle away from the festival goer and make it as easy as possible. But from what I do know of these festivals, after however many days, it's not going to look like that anymore. It's going to be covered in mud, it's going to be messy. My worry is you're not solving the problem, as in these people are too lazy to actually pack the stuff up. I would imagine the packing up of it is, in a way, worse than carrying it home. And I really applaud the sentiment behind what you're trying to do, but I just think fundamentally this is not solving the problem. Unless you can solve that laziness issue, I don't think the model will work. OK. So, I'm out. Sarah Davies is the first dragon to pack away any chance of investment. Does Peter Jones still think Nick's costs are a cause for concern? Nick, I'm 100% behind what you're trying to do. But as this goes on for many years, potentially, which is what you're hoping, you're going to end up losing money because it's going to cost you at least three or four pounds to keep returning these items. You're going to need a warehouse. And also, I think they don't need all of this stuff. Mm -hmm. They don't need pillows, they don't need the mats, they don't need a chair, they certainly don't need a hammer. How'd you put your pegs in? I probably use my heel, to be fair. Okay. Look, you know where I'm going here. I think that you've come up with all good intentions. That I don't think this could scale into a business. So for that reason, I'm out. I'll tell you what I'm thinking. Festivals themselves are going to have to sort this issue out. Because it's going to become a major issue and already is getting a lot of press attention uh, and awareness. Good luck, but I'm out. Nick, I'm going to quickly tell you where I am. I think you're halfway there on the idea, but I don't think it's the final idea. If it was me doing it, I'd be looking at a way of delivering it to the festival as a rental scheme or a buy scheme if they want to take it home with them. Mm -hmm. I don't like the idea of having to repatriate it back when they could carry it themselves. If you really believe in this and you really want to make it work, you don't need anybody in this room. You're blatantly a good businessman. But in this particular instance, I'm going to say, I'm out. 
Theopaphetus exits the party, leaving just Deborah Meaden to seal Nick's fate in the den. Will the ardent environmentalist give the green light to the entrepreneur's sustainable business? Nick, you are in the right space, thinking the right thoughts. But all the right thinking, I don't think it's the right solution. I used to have caravan and camping sites, and we put up tents for an entire season. They were expensive and they were high quality and they were reusable. The problem is here, you are producing disposable tents and you're asking them to pay way more money and reuse them. I think there's a different solution and it's probably not selling cheap tents. I'm not convinced that's the answer. I won't be investing, I, I'm out. Thanks, Nick. Thank you very Good much. Luck, Nick. Take Good care. luck. Good luck. Nick leaves the den without an investment from any dragon. He's zipping up his festival bag and heading home to the West Midlands. It's painful. I don't think they got the whole ideology. Well, we're working with the largest festival promoter in the UK. So only time will tell whether I'm right or they're wrong. <laughs> Come on, let's go camping, guys. Come on then, in you go. I might just take that as a handbag. That'll carry my makeup for me. <laughs> I think you need another. I, I, I need the bigger one. <laughs> <laughs>